The year is 1775 and the American Revolution is underway. The Americans have just won a shocking victory at Lexington and Concord and driven the British back to the town of Charleston. However, the Americans are hot on their heels. William Prescott and his American militia move in on the city of Boston and drive British General Thomas Gage's men out of Charleston and back into Boston. This marks the beginning of the one-year siege of the city. With this, General Gage sends word to Britain requesting reinforcements. Over the next several months, thousands of British men will flood into the city. General Gage now begins to plan his audacious counterattack to break out of the city of Boston and crush the rebellion once and for all. This is Grim Battaglia, and you're watching my documentary on the Battle for Boston Part 1, Bunker Hill. By May, General Thomas Gage has been joined by the future leader of British forces in the Americas, General William Howe. After Gage's retreat from Charleston, the island has become no man's land. Surrounded by artillery on both sides, neither force has been able to take this extremely valuable strategic location. However, Gage has a plan to end this siege. In a few weeks, he wishes to move his troops down the area known as Dorchester Heights. From there, he'll erect fortifications overlooking the American troops at Lamb's Dam and further push in. When the Americans reroute troops to defend the position, he'll launch an audacious naval invasion of Charleston. Once in position, the two prongs of his force will make a giant pincer movement, crushing the American troops at Cambridge and ending the revolution once and for all. The American forces in this battle will be led by General William Prescott, who will command around 2,400 American militiamen. On the British side, they will be led by General Thomas Gage, who commands 4,500 trained British infantry and has four warships at his disposal. Several days before the planned British invasion, the Americans learn of the attack. They send Commander Prescott the area of Bunker Hill and instruct him to make fortifications and make the area defensible. Prescott and his men move out across the hill on the night of June 16th. Under the cover of darkness, they begin building many powerful redoubts across the island, six feet deep with planks that will allow the Americans to shoot from cover. The British become aware of this, however, many opt not to do anything about it due to their hubris and underestimation of the American troops. Aboard one British warship, the crew takes it to their own hands and begins firing on the American position. This achieves success and ceases the Americans' building of their fortifications. However, the admiral of the ship awakens and commands the troops to cease firing. When the firing stops, the Americans move out and continue building fortifications all along the island. They built fences and barricades all along the hill to prevent the British from reaching their fortified position. Finally, a fence and new fortifications are built in an area north of the island, which will be known as Rail Fence, in order to prevent the British from completing a flanking motion around Breed's Hill. When daybreak comes on June 17th, the British become aware of just how strong the American position is. They decide to change their plan and attack the American stronghold right away. They begin the day with an artillery bombardment on the American position. However, the fortifications are well built and the Americans take little of any casualties. By 2 p.m., the British are ready to send their first wave of troops. An invasion force lands at Moulton's Hill and along the South Beach near Charleston. Howe and his men set up at Moulton Hill and prepare to eat lunch and await reinforcements. Howe believes he can easily overrun the American position if he simply gets more numbers. Meanwhile, an area known as Charleston's Neck, American troops attempt to come and reinforce General Preston. However, a British warship bombards the Neck and drives many of the American troops back. Several battalions do make it onto the island. However, confusion reigns supreme. Many of them lack any leaders or are unsure of what to do. They mill around the area of Bunker Hill, not becoming involved in the battle. Commanders at Bunker Hill are able to rally a few men and send them to reinforce the area known as Rail Fence. 
Meanwhile, a tank on the beach south of Charleston were bombarded by American snipers. They take many casualties and ask for reinforcements. The British command were prepared for this, and they've loaded a warship with incendiary rounds. The warship lays siege to the city of Charleston and sets the entire town alight, and the town begins to burn to the ground. By 3 p.m., the British reinforcements have made it to the island. In the north, Howe is reinforced by hundreds of grenadiers and light infantry. Meanwhile, a British force lands in Charleston and drives the American snipers out of their position. The town of Charleston continues to burn, releasing plumes of thick black smoke, which give a surreal backdrop to the battle underway on the island. Meanwhile, many Americans lose morale when they see the sheer number of British troops approaching them, and they flee back to another American position further beyond the island. The British plan is simple. They plan to advance under Howe in three main columns towards the area known as the Rail Fence. At the Rail Fence, they hope to oust the Americans and circumvent them, making a flanking motion around Breed's Hill. Meanwhile, the British forces on the south are instructed to launch a diversionary attack against the American right position in order to prevent those forces from reinforcing the Americans at the fence. With Howe's troops lined up, the attack is underway. However, they drastically underestimate the Americans. Their fortified position is extremely strong, and the British take many casualties during their If Howe and his men had attacked before the reinforcements arrived, it is very likely they could have overran the under-garrisoned rail fence. However, with the reinforcements, the Americans are able to drive Howe and his men back. It is said that British casualties were so high, some companies were left with only seven or eight men standing. In the south, the commander becomes aware of what happened to Howe's movement. He decides the time to attack is not now, and he orders his men to fall back towards the beach and await reinforcements. With this, the first wave of the British attack has been defeated. However, it won't be long before Howe calls for reinforcements and the British prepare to launch an audacious second attack upon the American positions. The Americans have won the first wave, but the British are not done yet. Howe sends word to Boston requesting reinforcements. By 4 p.m., his request is granted. Hundreds of fresh new infantrymen land safely on the beach and prepare to launch an audacious second wave of attack on the American position. In the Americans' rear position, confusion reigns supreme. The leader of this men are unsure of where to go, and as commanders try to direct men towards the battle to reinforce Breed's Hill and Rail Fence, they're able to achieve only limited success. Meanwhile, the British have come up with a new attack plan. They're going to have the Southern Force attack the fortified position on Breed's Hill, supposedly without any support from Howe and his battalions. This audacious attack shows just how much the British have underestimated the Americans. They believe that the Americans will collapse and rout upon first real contact with the British forces, but they're about to be proved wrong. In the north, Howe and his thousands of new fresh troops are going to march again at the rail fence, hoping this time to push out the Americans once and for all. The attack commences and is faced with similar results as the first wave. British casualties are enormous as the Americans hold fast in their fortified positions. Many British die, and they're forced to retreat. The British were once again forced back to the beach, and this time they join the Americans in their disarray. Thousands of wounded British troops line the beach, waiting to be ferried back to Boston, while hundreds of new troops landed. There was panic, chaos, and mostly disorder amongst the British, lining all the beaches. Meanwhile, the American position continued to give way. Many Americans, seeing they were low on ammo, succumbed to fear and tried to flee. Other Americans, who were directed to join the battle, moved backwards to the safer areas of Bunker Hill. One full battalion of American troops tried to withdraw. Upon seeing this, a commander ordered his men to move in front of them and told his men, If they try to leave, I command you to fire upon them. With that, the routing troops were subdued and they rejoined the battle 
at their commander's order. By 5 p.m., order had been restored amongst the British troops. Many fresh men now landed on the island and were ready to partake in the next wave of attack on the American positions. The British plan this time was simple. They're going to send a small diversionary force towards rail fence in order to distract the Americans, while the rest of the force would all attack Breed's Hill and attempt to engage the Americans in a melee. They'd noted the American rate of fire had been reducing and theorized the Americans were running low on ammo. This theory would prove to be correct. In a melee, the Americans carried mostly only hunting rifles and lacked any bayonets. If the British troops could enter the fortifications with their bayonets drawn, they'd be able to quickly overwhelm the Americans at Breed's Hill. The attack began and the diversionary force moved towards rail fence. American troops from Bunker Hill were able to be rallied and moved to reinforce the position. Meanwhile, more troops started to move towards Breed's Hill and Prescott moved to oversee the defense. The order was given and the British advanced as one, giving the rally in charge. They engaged the Americans in a melee and quickly were able to overcome their resistance. The Americans began to break and Prescott ordered for a retreat. The Americans then began to move back and abandon the fortification. Prescott bravely drew his ceremonial saber and engaged in melee combat against the British forces. He would be one of the last Americans to leave the redoubt and shockingly would make it out of the battle with his life intact. Meanwhile, the commander at Rail Fence observed what was happening. He took charge and ordered his men to form an orderly and calm retreat away from their position. If not for his leadership, it's theorized that many, many more American lives would have been lost. But due to his calm and collected retreat, hundreds, if not thousands of Americans were able to retreat with their lives intact. Seeing that almost all the men had left the island, General Prescott took the remainder of his men and retreated. The British had won the battle for Bunker Hill and now controlled the strategically important peninsula. The British successfully captured the island. However, General Prescott and his men had moved to an area just north known as Cobble Hill and fortified it. From that position, they were able to keep the British pinned down and locked inside the area of Boston. So, while the British had won the day, they'd failed to achieve their overall objective of freeing themselves from the siege of Boston. The American casualties in this battle were relatively light, with only 400 killed, captured, or wounded, the vast majority of which came during the retreat from Banner Hill. Meanwhile, British casualties were, were numbered into the thousands, including many high-ranking and important officers. For his defeat, General Gage was relieved of his position, and General Howe was promoted to supreme command of British forces in the Americas. In a few months, Washington would join Prescott at the Siege of Boston. Washington would meet Commander-in-Chief of the British forces, General Howe, here in battle for the first time. However, it certainly would not be the last. Tune in next week to see the follow-up to this episode and see the exciting conclusion to the Siege of Boston. This was the Battle for Boston Part 1, Bunker Hill. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like, comment, or subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching and never stop learning.